Hey everybody, uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Montgomery. Uh, I just decided to do something a little different, something fun, um, given that uh, my normal daily life as a professional musician has been disrupted by this difficult pandemic. Um, I'm not only a musician, but I'm an avid reader and also a writer. I've been writing more recently. I'm a huge fan of fantasy literature, most specifically, hence why I decided to make this video. Um, very simply put, this is just going to be a review of my five favorite fantasy series that I have read. So I'm just going to jump right into it and say one series that I'm not going to include on this list is probably the most famous, most prolific uh, fantasy series ever written, and that is J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. The reason for that is I just don't really feel comfortable including it because, as most people probably know, and especially fans of fantasy know, Lord of the Rings basically paved the way for almost all fantasy that came after it. Um, hugely influential to um, all of the authors that I'm going to be mentioning later on, Brandon Sanderson, George R. R. Martin, Stephen King, Patrick Rothfuss, and etc. For those of you who might not know about Lord of the Rings, I assume all of you do, um, it follows uh, a hobbit. Hobbits are basically like human beings, but smaller, bigger feet. They eat more. They live to be longer. Um, they're very quirky creatures. Uh, follows a hobbit named Frodo Baggins. Um, he is given a ring by his uncle Bilbo Baggins. That is uh, the one ring of power. Without getting too much into the lore, um, this ring is incredibly powerful. And uh, the Dark Lord Sauron, who at the beginning of the series is gathering power um he wants the ring back he forged it many years ago he wants the ring back if he gets the ring back he'll basically be all powerful and humanity um, will be doomed simply put so frodo is uh you know basically um convinced to take the ring to mordor um to destroy it in the fire in which it was created um, Gandalf the wizard is the person who convinces him to do this. He and a handful of other hobbits, um, and, and also an elf and a dwarf and two humans, create a fellowship. Um, the name of the first book is The Fellowship of the Ring, and they go to um, accomplish this very difficult task. There's a lot more after that. I'm not going to get too much into the plots of any of these books in case people haven't read them, or if you have read them, I don't want to be redundant here. Um, Lord of the Rings is spectacular for many reasons probably the biggest one being the world building is incredible world building is a phrase that comes up a lot in fantasy and science fiction it means exactly what it sounds like you create your own universe you create your own history in the case of lord of the rings your own races there are men there are elves dwarves hobbits etc um, the world is vast and beautiful um, token also released a book called the silmarillion which is more or less a history of the world and a history of specifically the elves in Middle-earth, which is the name of the um, continent, you could say, or the world. Um, as I said, it influenced so much that came after it. It is uh, brilliantly written. It reads so well. It's just an incredible story. I highly recommend it to anyone and everyone, whether or not you think you'd be a fan of fantasy. The Lord of the Rings is a, is a classic. Um, again, I won't get too much into that one, but above all else, The Lord of the Rings reigns supreme. Anybody who's watching this for fantasy recommendations, I would say do that first and then, you know, maybe afterwards watch uh, the movies, which are incredible, and maybe afterwards read the other books that I'm going to bring up. So my fifth favorite fantasy series I've read is The Dark Tower by Stephen King. Um, those of you who are familiar with Stephen King, whether, you know, from reading his books or just, you know, you know his name, he's obviously a very famous author, one of the most prolific authors in American history. Um, he is most well known for writing horror stories, right? It, The Shining, um, Salem's Lot, Carrie, etc. Um, many of his books have been made into uh, television shows, films, etc. This series is, while it does have some horror elements, it really is an epic fantasy series. This is, in Stephen King's own words, his homage to J.R.R. Tolkien, of whom he is a huge fan and has gained a lot of inspiration. Um, the Dark Tower is difficult to explain. It's a very long series. It's seven books long. 
Um, it's one of the few series that I'm going to mention here on this list that is actually complete. So the Dark Tower series is finished. You can read it from start to end. Um, seven books long, like I mentioned. It follows a gunslinger named Roland Deshane. Uh, the very beginning of the story, I believe the first line is something along the lines of the gunslinger chased the man in black across the desert. Something like that. Very poetic, obviously. Um, Roland is chasing this man in black who we find out later is this dark wizard named Randall Flagg. He goes by many names, and actually for anybody who's read other Stephen King books, this antagonist is present in a lot of them. Actually, you can look up online how many of Stephen King's other novels tie into the Dark Tower universe, and a lot of them do. It included, um, Salem's Lot included, uh, The Stand included as well. He is the antagonist in The Stand, I can say. I just read that recently. So Randall Flagg is the antagonist. Um, as we read more, uh, you basically realize Roland Deschain is searching out the Dark Tower, which is kind of this exactly what it sounds like it's a giant dark tower it's this kind of mythical um very mysterious place you don't really know why roland is trying to find it but you know that that's m almost his primary motivation in life is to get to this tower and it's incredibly important to him that he does so um more about that is revealed over time of course it's a long series what i'll say without giving too much away also is that the ending is devastating the thing that i love the most about the series is the ending specifically for roland the main protagonist there are other protagonists there's three other people who are main characters in the story um, but roland's ending specifically is so devastating so crazy really polarizing too a lot of people hated it i loved it it's one of the most surprising like gut-wrenching endings i've ever read um totally crazy just thinking about it now makes me want to read it again um excellent series what i'll say about it other than those little things that i just gave you it's definitely the most genuinely unique inventive fantasy series i've ever read um, a lot of fantasy is coming straight from tolkien um, a lot of fantasy has elves dwarves or even if not that it's mirroring a more medieval time right the dark tower is not like that at all a lot of the story takes place in new york city actually at different eras of time which is really interesting um or in you know other mythical lands that feel a lot more like fantasy especially book four which was my favorite wizard and glass is a much more fantastical environment but nothing like any fantasy i've ever read stephen king makes some wild decisions really wild decisions and does some really strange and incredible things with the story and with his characters um, it is a trip. It is a ride. I would say, especially if you are a fan of Stephen King, you should absolutely read this series, no question. Um, if you're a fan of fantasy, again, read this series. It's wonderful, and it's very different from anything else you've read, I can almost guarantee. Um, one thing I will say that's important to bring up, uh, one criticism I have of the series, is that the first book is kind of rough. It's not very easy to get through. Um, as with a lot of fantasy series, for those who haven't read too many, there's always a learning curve, right? If there's a well-developed world or universe, it's going to take time for you to understand what's happening. So when you first jump into the story, maybe the characters are using language you don't understand. They're likely referencing things that you can't understand yet. That can be difficult when you jump into a new series. I felt that very strongly reading the first book, which is called The Gunslinger. Uh, luckily, it is a short book. Um, it's easy to get through regardless and I would say if you do read the series and you read that first book and you're not crazy about it, just give book two a shot. Maybe read 50 to 100 pages of book two. It's incredible. I really specifically enjoyed book two among the seven. I would say my favorite was book four, but book two is great. It kind of just continues to ramp up from there. Um, really well thought out. Really brilliant. Um, I can't recommend it more highly. So yeah, number five, that's The Dark Tower by Stephen King. So number four for me, is the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. <clears throat> My number three pick is also by Brandon Sanderson. That's the Mistborn trilogy. I had a hard time deciding which one I wanted at number three and number four. Simply put, the reason I put Mistborn at number three and Stormlight Archive at number four is not a difference in quality, in my opinion. It's really just the fact that the Mistborn trilogy is finished and the ending is beautiful. It's a very compact story. It's so well told. The ending is really incredible. Whereas the Stormlight Archive actually is not finished yet. Um, that being said, they're both wonderful. I highly recommend them both. Um, but to dive right into it, 
the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. Currently, there are four books um, out. The fourth book just came out very recently. I'm reading it now. Um, it is planned to be a 10-book series. Um, he has said that he's going to write book five, and that books one through five will be like one era of the Stormlight Archive, and then he will write the second era, books six through ten. So it's difficult to explain the Stormlight Archive because it is a l very large-scale, huge plot, um, similar to something like Game of Thrones, where there's so much happening that it's hard to explain without taking a lot of time. I will do my best, though. Um, when we begin the story, The Way of Kings is the first book in the series, by the way. Absolutely incredible book. One of my favorite books I've ever read. So wonderful. The Way of Kings more or less begins, we're on a continent called Roshar. We're in a kingdom called Alethkar. And there's a king named uh, Gavilar Colin, right? The very beginning, he is having a feast in his home in the castle. Um, he welcomes these people called the Parshendi, who are of a different race. They're not humans. Um, everybody there is kind of baffled by the Parshendi because they... Um, have many people in this society, especially the higher-born people called light-eyed people, have uh, Parshmen that work for them. They're kind of like slaves, basically. And uh, the Parshendi are related to the Parshmen, but they can actually speak. They're capable of intelligent thought, and this is something that the humans have never experienced before. So there's this big feast being held. There's people coming from all across the kingdom, uh, including these new Parshendi. The King Gavilar Kalin at this feast in his own home is murdered right um by the assassin in white um we fast forward about six or seven years and there's a large-scale war happening on the shattered plains um that gavilar's son elokar Kalin, who is now the king is you know heading um there are different high princes in this kingdom um one of the high princes is named dalinar Kalin, who is a major character there are many many others and basically they're fighting out on the plains they're fighting against the Parshendi. So that's kind of where we start the story. There's this war happening. It's a very long, protracted war, very exhausting war. Um, again, it, I can't get into too much of the plot here because it's such a large-scale thing, but I will do, say what I can. Each of the first three books, the ones that I've read, in, anyway, The Way of Kings, book two is Words of Radiance, and book three is Oathbringer. The formatting is really, really interesting in that each book, you know, Chronologically, you're starting in one spot and you're moving forward. You're getting the perspective of many different characters, similar to something like Game of Thrones. But in each book, you're also getting a fair number of flashbacks about um, individual characters, right? In book one, as the plot moves forward, you're seeing one character named Kaladin in real time, but you're also getting a bunch of flashbacks about his young life, um, which helps you to see how he has become the kind of person that he has become. Very compelling book. Kaladin is an incredible protagonist, one of my favorites I've ever read. In book two, it's the same thing, but with Shalon Devar, another protagonist. And book three is the same, but with Dalinar Colin, who I mentioned before. Um, this is really interesting because you are seeing how they are acting, you know, in present day. Um, obviously, these characters are really, really complicated. They're so well thought out. Brandon Sanderson does such a great job of developing his characters. Um, so you're wondering all this time, oh, why is Kaladin this way? Why does he do these things? Why does he think this way? And then you're seeing over the course of the book, oh, because of this that happened, because of this, it creates a lot of drama too. Um, so again, I'll just dive into what's really, really great about this series. The character work is brilliant, like I said. Not only are the characters really deep and believable, and there's a lot of them, a lot of them struggle with real-life problems. Kaladin, for example, um, suffers from depression, uh, Dalinar Colin suffers from some PTSD and definitely from alcoholism and Shalon from what you could potentially call multiple personality disorder and some past trauma as well. Um, in an interview by Brandon Sanderson, he's done many interviews, uh, all of which are on YouTube. Um, he explains that, you know, I wanted to write characters that felt real, that felt human and human beings deal with this stuff. You know, people have depression, people are alcoholics or addicted to drugs, you know, so he wanted his characters to feel real. Um, so he really did his research on these on these issues, and they don't feel caricature caric they don't feel like caricatures, I should say. Um, the problems that they deal with are real, and the implications are real, and you feel that as you read them. It's really brilliant. 
Um, Brandon Sanderson also, better than anyone else, I would say, his magic systems are really interesting and so well thought out. Um, they're what you would call hard magic systems. For those of you who may not be familiar with that term, hard magic systems basically means there's rules. There's clear rules as to what is possible and what is not possible, right? Soft magic systems are kind of the opposite. They're more, they create more of a sense of intrigue or mysticism. But some people don't find them as satisfying because you don't know the limits. A great example is Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. We're not really sure what he's capable of entirely. It's never said. Um, a lot of people would say it doesn't need to be, but it really depends on the story. You know, Brandon is really great with those hard magic systems in both the Stormlight Archive and the Mistborn series. Um, also, the world building is incredible. He creates such a beautiful, unique world. A lot of modern fantasy does not um, have um, non-human races. A lot of fantasy, modern fantasy is just about human beings, which is great, but it is really cool to see other races be introduced, and the Parshendi are a really interesting um, race of people, if you could call them people. I think... Otherwise, I would just say one thing to be warned of if you're interested in reading the Stormlight Archive. The books are very long. Book one is about a thousand pages. Each book thereafter is a little longer than that. I will say, however, that they go by smoothly. I did not at any point feel like, oh, this is a really long book when I was reading The Way of Kings, especially the first book in the series. Um, so worth your time. It's, it, it, there's a large learning curve because there's a lot you have to learn as you read, but it's so worth it. You really get immersed into the world that Brandon Sanderson has created and um, highly, highly recommend reading the Stormlight Archive. So number three on my list, another series by Brandon Sanderson. This is called the Mistborn Trilogy. Uh, the Mistborn Trilogy is absolutely incredible. It follows a protagonist named Vin who is more or less at the beginning of the story. She's a street urchin kind of. She's living you know, on the street. Uh, she's an orphan. She doesn't have anything to her name. But she's scraping by because she's incredibly smart and very crafty. She is more or less saved by a man named Kelsier who recruits her to his team of allomancers. So allomancers are people who can ingest small amounts of metal and burn it in their digestive system to create you know, different desired effects. I believe there are eight allomantic metals at the beginning of the story. And uh, obviously there are normal human beings who cannot do this, who are not allomancers. Then there are allomancers who can burn one specific type of metal, like they can only burn steel or iron or copper or etc., and produce one magical effect. But then there are people called Mistborn who can burn all of the metals and do all of these incredible things. They're very, very rare. Um, Kelsier is one of these people, and he is the one who can tell that, even though she doesn't know it, Vin is also a Mistborn. So he recruits her to his team. His goal is to overthrow, to infiltrate, and then hopefully overthrow the Lord Ruler, right? So the Lord Ruler in this world that we're in is a bad guy. The world is kind of falling apart. It's dark. It's dirty. Um, it's oppressive, right? So basically... Um, they delve into the history as the story goes on. I won't get into it here, but the bad guy won, kind of. The Lord Ruler is the bad guy, right? So Kellis, you're saying we need to take him down. It's an incredibly lofty goal because the Lord Ruler is exceptionally powerful. So basically seems like impossible. He's also immortal. So difficult. Uh, we start off with that very complicated premise. It's also kind of like a heist premise. Brandon Sanderson has said... Um, that the series is kind of like heist meets my fair lady because there is a point at which Vin is trying to infiltrate the higher level of society and has to pretend to be this uh, prim proper lady which she is not at all um, so that's a very interesting part of the plot uh, Mistborn is uh, really really well thought out the plot is incredible all three books are really well thought out really wonderful the ending as I mentioned earlier is so brilliant. It's really, really heartbreaking, but perfectly legitimate. I remember reading book three, which is called The Hero of Ages, and one of the characters I liked the most, I felt like, was really letting me down, and I was surprised because Brandon Sanderson creates such interesting characters, 
as I was reading, I was like, God, why isn't this character doing anything? Why is this happening this way? But once we got to the end of the story, it clicked and made perfect sense to me. Um, and I was just so blown away. I was just like, oh, my God, I was so wrong. And I love that feeling when you're like, I don't like this. This is kind of rubbing me the wrong way. Only to then realize, like, they were doing this on purpose for this reason. Um, such a well-thought-out story. The characters are really, really um, real. Same as the Stormlight Archive. Brandon Sanderson is so great with that. The magic system, again, is awesome. Allomancy is such an interesting magic. There's other magic that is um, revealed as the story goes on. I won't talk about that here. Um, but yeah, it's a three-book series. It's compact. I recommend it to people who haven't read fantasy before or who are not trying to read like a thousand-page book like I am. Um, the books are definitely shorter. I think the longest one is maybe 800. Um, there's also a Mistborn Era 2. I believe it's called Wax and Wayne series. I haven't read that yet. I've heard it's really great. Um, but yeah, Mistborn is a wonderful series. I recommend it to anyone and everyone. Um, so that's number three for me, Mistborn by... Brandon Sanderson. So coming in at number two for me, my second favorite fantasy series I've ever read is A Song of Ice and Fire, otherwise known as Game of Thrones. Anyone who knows me at all knows how ridiculously obsessed I am with Game of Thrones. I've read all of the books in the series. There are five currently in the book series. There is also a historical book about the Targaryen kings uh, called The World of Ice and Fire. Um, oh no, that's actually called Fire and Blood. My mistake. The World of Ice and Fire is like more of a history book, somewhat similar to the Silmarillion, um, with a lot of beautiful illustrations as well. And then there are these uh, short stories about um, Princess Aegon and Sir Duncan the Tall um, that take place long before the events of Game of Thrones. But my point being, I've read all that is published um, within the Game of Thrones universe. Mega fan. Of course, I've watched the show. So one thing I will start with. I just want to get this out there. I just want to make this clear. I'm a huge fan of the television show. It is no surprise to anybody um, that I would say or that anyone would say that the ending was pretty bad. Um, I really hope that the ending being poor wouldn't you know, dissuade people from reading the books. Um, for those of us who've watched the television show, we can probably all agree that the beginning of the show is wonderful. I really love seasons one through four. Those are the ones that I love the most. Big part of the reason for that is they're taking material straight from the books. A lot of the dialogue in that first season, especially right out of George R. R. Martin's mouth. You know, they, David Benioff and Dan Weiss were telling George's story on, you know, the big screen. Technically not, but um, so well done. I will defend David and Dan when I say that, you know, the series isn't finished yet. There are five books. George says there's going to be seven. And he has not released book six yet. It's been about nine years. So he's, you know, maybe dragging his feet. But it's an incredibly complicated series with a ton of characters and a huge world to keep track of. So I give David and Dan credit for having to finish it without a ton of guidance. George didn't give them all the information, probably because he might not even know every element of the ending yet he is a discovery writer or somebody who discovers as they're writing different elements of the plot he doesn't have everything figured out beforehand in his head like some authors do so they didn't have a ton of guidance is my assumption and they did what they could i definitely thought it was rushed and there's no excuse for that and that very much bothers me but you know george hasn't even finished writing this series yet it's so complicated and crazy in so many ways what chance are two new showrunners and writers going to have finishing an epic fantasy series well? A pretty bad one. And I think they assumed the series would be done by the time they got to that point. So I give them credit for that. Um, and I give them credit for, you know, I'm thankful that they introduced me to the books by having that show on HBO. I watched the first couple seasons, then I read the first book. I loved it, and I kept going. So now I'll delve into it a little more. I assume everybody knows a little bit about Game of Thrones. There's dragons, Jon Snow, Winter is Coming, all that stuff. Um, but for anybody who might not, uh, simply put, it's such a complicated plot that it's hard to try to summarize it. Most of the story takes place on a continent called Westeros. Um, there is a king at the very beginning of the story named Robert Baratheon, uh, who sits on the Iron Throne, which is the you know, throne in the capital. Um, John, uh, Robert Baratheon's right hand, or his, the hand of the king, his right hand man, John Aaron, 
who was also his mentor as a young person, dies. So he reaches out to his childhood friend and his former um, companion on the battlefield, Ned Stark, who lives in the north in a place called Winterfell. He tells Ned, hey, I need you to move from Winterfell to the capital to be my Hand of the King because John Aaron is dead. A lot more plot complications arise as you start to see, did John Aaron just die of natural causes or was there something else happening? Right, so that's kind of where the intrigue begins. Again, that's just one part of the plot. That's a good place to begin the explanation, but there's so much more. There's a lot of other characters. Um, the big thing, especially in the beginning, is people vying for the throne, people wanting power, wanting to be close to the seat of power. It's a fantasy series, but it's also really a drama, I think. It's very dramatic. It's a lot about the intrigue and the deception. That's like what makes the story so interesting, in my opinion. There's also a supernatural element. There's the introduction of dragons. That is something that happens at the very end of book one and is a really great, interesting reveal. But anybody who knows anything about Game of Thrones, there's dragons in it. We kind of know that's not really much of a giveaway. Um, there are dragons. There's also these uh, kind of like ice zombies is an easy way to say it. Uh, people called White Walkers that live in the very, very far north part of Westeros um, beyond the wall, which is a giant, very long, hundreds of feet tall wall made of ice that was created thousands of years before the events of Game of Thrones to keep the White Walkers out and other threats out. So that's an existential threat that kind of continues to creep up as the story moves forward. Um, what I'll say about the series, it's mind-blowing. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's one of the best series of books I've ever read. The biggest reason is the character work. No author I've ever read in any genre has done better character work than George R. R. Martin in The Song of Ice and Fire characters are so complicated so believable so relatable even the heroes and the show doesn't show this as much but in the books you're you're seeing through their minds so you see a lot more the people you really love that seem like just good people like this is a good guy they deal with internal struggle they have bad thoughts they consider doing bad things or sometimes they do do bad things and then on the flip side the really bad people who are bad guys there's reasons why they are like that they deal with things themselves they don't see themselves as a bad guy perhaps and there's all kinds of characters in between um, what we call gray characters who are the furthest thing from fitting into good or bad right those kinds of characters are really interesting to read because they challenge our own you know moral sense right a character like jamie lannister is a great example um sandor clagain otherwise known as the hound those are just two examples of gray characters who are really interesting to read. Um, the book format is really cool. Every chapter is named after a major character, and it's through their perspective. So you're reading through the eyes of Tyrion Lannister and then Daenerys Targaryen and etc. Um, you're seeing through, you're seeing the world through their eyes. Uh, one thing I find really, really unbelievable, honestly, about the series is the characters are so complicated. The plot is so ridiculously complicated. And yet every decision that each character makes makes perfect sense at the time, given what they know, right? Which, se which is impossible. It just seems crazy to me that someone could do that. They could write hundreds of characters and every little thing they do, even though it might seem totally nuts on the outset, makes perfect sense based on their motivations, what they know at the time, what they want, right? Um, such brilliant character work. It's written in such a clear way. It's very easy to read. All the books I've mentioned actually read very smoothly. You know, Brandon Sanderson's writing is very clear. Stephen King's writing is very clear. There's not a lot of flowery language to move through, unlike with Tolkien, which, you know, that's an older era of writing, so it makes sense. But yeah, The Song of Ice and Fire is incredible. Uh, I recommend it to anyone and everyone. I am way too obsessed with that series. I'm very much so anticipating the release of book six, which is called The Winds of Winter. One fair warning for this series and the next one I'm going to mention is um, it's not finished yet. Uh, book five, The Dance of Dragons, something like that, came out in 2011, and it's 2020, and The Winds of Winter is not out yet. So it's taking a very long time. A lot of people are fed up of waiting. A lot of people have just assumed he's never going to write it. I sincerely hope that he does. So if you get into the series, just be warned that you will have to wait for those last two books. I wouldn't say to wait until they're out to read it because it's so wonderful. You should just read it now. It's going to take you a while anyway. There's five books, roughly a thousand pages each, but they read really smoothly. 
Um, highly, highly recommended. That's number two for me, A Song of Ice and Fire, a.k.a. Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. All right, so before I tell you guys my favorite fantasy series, I want to do some honorable mentions. I've read a lot of fantasy over the last couple years, really my whole life, but especially over the last few years. Um, I love the genre so much, and I want to share all the books I've read with you guys that I've enjoyed. So a couple other series. I would comfortably call this one number six. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's a series called The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. Um, the Poppy War is Chinese-inspired fantasy. Uh, I always really enjoy reading fantasy that is not influenced by medieval times or by Tolkien, those very classic structures. Um, Chinese-inspired fantasy, very dark, I will say. Much like Game of Thrones. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. It's a very dark story. Um, it doesn't start off that way, but as you read, it becomes a lot more intense. And I really appreciate that because it's about war, obviously. And war is really dark in a way that I'll never understand, and a lot of people my age will never understand firsthand. Thank goodness. Um, it follows a protagonist named Rin. Um, she uh, lives in a kind of small town in the Rooster Province. She hates her life, and she really wants to escape. So her way to do so is to study up for this one test, the name of which is escaping me, so that she can go to uh, this university and, you know, build a new life for herself, basically. So she studies up crazy hard and is able to pass the test with flying colors. She's one of the first people in many, many, many years to go to this university from Rooster Province. She gets there, and um, it's a military university, but one element of study there is shamanism. And shamanism at this point in history, in this world, is kind of dying, and it's also somewhat frowned upon. So there are not very many shamans. The art is kind of lost. But she realizes that she has this ability um, to become a shaman. And she pursues that. So I won't say much more than that other than that it's an incredible series. The last book of the series just came out recently, The Burning God. I have not read that yet, but books one and two, book two is called The Dragon Republic, are so wonderful. Highly recommend that. That's The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. I also really loved the first Law trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. He is drawing a lot of influence, I think, from George R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones. It's very dark, again, very... It falls into a subcategory of fantasy that people call grim dark fantasy. A Song of Ice and Fire, The Poppy War, and First Law trilogy all could be categorized as grim dark fantasy. Really compelling characters in the First Law trilogy. I won't get into too much of the plot again, it's a little complicated, but characters are really interesting there's one character specifically that i love named sand dan glockta very fun to read very very gray character um really interesting story beautifully written um the plot is not what you'd expect it really threw me in a very good way so if you're looking for something a little different I would say definitely read the First Law Trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. He has a bunch of other books that I need to read. So there's a lot to dive into with Joe Abercrombie. Uh, another series I really love is called The Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemison. N.K. Jemison just was awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant, actually, um, which is so well-deserved in my opinion. She's a brilliant author. Um, the Broken Earth Trilogy is a really interesting, unique trilogy. The main thing that makes it stand out from other series, in my opinion, is it's a geological fantasy series, as weird as that sounds. The magic is based in geology. A lot of the names of characters are names of different minerals. Very interesting plot. Not, I wouldn't call it dark, but it is you know, intense. The main protagonist is a very conflicted person. Um, wonderful story by a wonderful new author um she also uh each book in the trilogy she released them three years in a row i think it may have been 2015 16 and 17 maybe each book in every subsequent year won the hugo award for best new fantasy book which has never happened before nobody has ever had every book in of a series win that award in consecutive years absolutely wonderful highly recommended that might do it. Oh, of course, um, I forget these because I read them so long ago when I was so young, but of course I love the Harry Potter series. Huge fan. Um, obviously there is 
uh, some conflict happening with uh, J.K. Rowling's views on transgender people. I will make it very clear and say that I completely disagree with her views. I think they're horrible, and I have lost a lot of respect for her as a result of her coming out and saying those things. That being said, the book series is wonderful. I enjoyed it so much as a kid, and it helped foster my love of fantasy. I won't go into details about it. I mean, everybody knows what Harry Potter is, I would assume. And that, I would say, covers it. So now I will let you guys know what my favorite fantasy series is. So my number one absolute favorite fantasy series I've ever read is The King Killer Chronicle by Patrick Rothfuss. Um, this is a trilogy, the third book of which has not been released. The first two books are The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear. The Name of the Wind is my favorite book, period. I love it so much. I've recommended it to over a dozen people. I've bought, I think, eight copies of the book now, one for myself and you know, a bunch of others for families, family, friends, people who I want to read the book, and I've recommended it to a bunch of other people. Everyone I know who's read it in its entirety really loved it. My mom, who hates fantasy, she's not into it, loved it so much. She read Name of the Wind, then immediately read The Wise Man's Fear, which is like an 1,100-page book. She tore through it. Really brilliant series. So, um, simply put, there's a man named Kvoth. At the very beginning of the story, he's hiding out. He is um, an infamous figure. We realize that at the beginning, but we don't know why. He's an infamous figure, but he has um, kind of become a recluse. He is an innkeeper, and he's trying to keep his identity under wraps. Um, that eventually fails him when, um, on the road, he runs into a man named the Chronicler. Uh, he ends up having to help the Chronicler out of a very difficult situation and brings him back to his uh, inn to help him heal and stuff like that. The Chronicler knows who he is. His job basically is to go around and detail people's um, life stories, right? Um, so he knows who Kvothe is by his appearance, and he says, oh, you must be Kvothe. I, I recognize you, right? Which upsets Kvothe at first because he's trying to lay low, but then he realizes, oh, this guy's the Chronicler. He could tell my life story. Maybe I actually would, would want that. So he tells the Chronicler, okay, it's going to take a full three days for me to recount to you my entire life story. The Chronicler reluctantly agrees. It usually doesn't take that long. But that's kind of the setup for the book. There's supposed to be three books, and each book is one full day of him retelling his entire life story. Some people have complained that this setup is strange because he's going into such great, intense detail people are saying well how could he remember all of this you know and how could he be be saying all of this you know remembering everything so perfectly the thing is what you learn very quickly is Kvothe the main reason he became the infamous person that he was is he's a genius simply put um his memory is basically perfect um he is a much much more highly functioning person than any normal human being um, he, the story begins with him. He lives uh, with his parents. They're a traveling troupe of entertainers, uh, singers, actors, jugglers, etc. He um, grows up singing, writing songs, playing lute, right? So he's a musician. That's part of the reason I love this series so much is I am also a musician, so I can relate to him. Um, as the story goes on, more and more things happen. He's uh, learning about all kinds of things, chemistry and, you know, language and all these things that we learn, but also more um, magical concepts such as sympathy, sigildry, things like that. He eventually ends up attending uh, this place simply called the university where he's learning more of these um, things. It's a really interesting mix in this story of hard magic systems and soft magic systems. Um, a system like sympathy is a hard magic system with rules that are explained that make a lot of sense. Uh, whereas a uh, magic system like naming, for example, is completely mystical and very um, difficult to understand, pretty much inexplainable. Um, the, th the thing about the book that I love so dearly is I've never cared more about a protagonist that I've read or seen in a movie or a TV show or anything than I do about Kvothe. Um, he is a, he's a little shit, is what I like to say. It's like, he's just kind of being a shit here. Um, he's a tricky guy. Again, he's ridiculously intelligent he uses his intelligence to get him out of difficult situations it's always great to read something like that like how is he gonna outsmart this person or this person um but he deals with a lot of struggle he's had a lot of intense pain throughout his young life and one thing i really love about the story is um how rothfuss talks about music 
Uh, usually I don't like reading about music. I am a musician myself. That's my career. Um, I'm a bass player and a composer. I usually don't like reading about music because it doesn't feel sufficient. It's like, you know, music is music. And if you're just going to talk to me about it, it's not really going to do justice relative to the listening to music, at least for me. Usually it's either people trying to say things that are like wrote about music. And sometimes people are just incorrect. I'm just going to say it really bothers me. Um, or they're using all this flowery language to explain what the music sounded like. And it's like, you're never going to be able to explain it better than just, you know, me listening to it. Right. Um, but Patrick does such a great job of explaining not only like musical things like uh, scenes where Kvothe is playing or Kvothe is talking about how he feels about music. They feel so real and so impassioned. He also does a great job of just explaining the issues that musicians deal with. One of the first scenes in the beginning when you first, you know, meet him as, you know, a young person and his parents, the traveling troop goes to a town. They tell the city lord or whatever, hey, here we're here to perform. And the city lord's like, oh, well, you got to stay outside the city limits. You can't use the public hall. The last people, like, trashed it, so, like, don't do that. And he was being very disrespectful to the performers. I read that, and I was like, man, I've been there. How many gigs have I gone to where, like, the bar owner's like, you guys can't have free drinks. The last band, like, the guy got trashed. Like, little things like that. Um kind of recur throughout the book basically he's explaining situations that all musicians have dealt with that really piss us off um one other thing too is he's uh he goes on at length at many points about his money concerns you know he's a poor guy trying to go to school and make money playing music and for me i am that person i have been that person i'm not in school anymore but when i was i was like i get it i'm with you kvoth this is hard keep it up man you can do it you know uh, i just felt that that really intense camaraderie with him as a result of uh, that shared interest in music <sighs> other things about this book it's written beautifully the prose just flows so freely um really really smooth read and i'd say more so than the other series i've mentioned it's just like the writing is really compelling so for people who like literary fiction perhaps or really prefer like more flowery language or things that are more um, artistic in that regard you would enjoy this um also there's just so much fun stuff happening in the series like different s large events like big things happening to both or even just little tiny things that seem insignificant everything is just written in a way that really draws you in and makes you root for him very intensely at least in my case um the only concern is is the same as with game of thrones book three the doors of stone has not been released yet, and book two was released in 2011, which was the same year as the most recent Song of Ice and Fire book. We don't know when book three is going to come. We have no clue when we're going to get the conclusion to this series. I've been waiting quite a while, not nearly as long as some people who read The Wise Man's Sphere in 2011, but, you know, I am very confident that he's going to end it brilliantly. I loved The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Sphere. I could not possibly recommend this series more highly, The King Killer Chronicle, by Patrick Rothfuss. All right, so if you've made it to the end, I'm genuinely surprised. Thank you for sticking around. Um, to recap, uh, the series that I've mentioned here are The Lord of the Rings, not on this list, but a must read, a classic, influenced everything after it. So beautiful. Number five for me is The Dark Tower by Stephen King. Number four, that's The Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. Number three is The Mistborn Trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. Number two is A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. And at number one is The King Killer Chronicle by Patrick Rothfuss. I really highly recommend that you guys read all of those books. I know that's a lot. Um, if I had to pick just one book to recommend to you all today, I will give the book that I recommend to everyone. That's The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. It's wonderful. More than anything else, I hope you're all doing okay in this very difficult time. A lot of turmoil, not just as a result of this pandemic, but, you know, other things going on in this country and all across the world. Um, I have found so much joy and serenity and solace in reading and writing as well. Um, fantasy is wonderful in that it can take you away. You know, we were just talking earlier about world building. It's nice to get away, to go hang out in Westeros or hang out in Roshar or wherever else for a little while to just take your mind off of what's happening. I think is a beautiful thing. So for any of you who are fantasy fans and haven't read any of these books I've mentioned, I recommend them. They're worth your time. 
for anyone who's not much of a fantasy fan but is a reader highly recommend all of them as well especially the name of the wind and anybody who's not much of a reader but watch this anyway now's as good a time as any to start reading fantasy or not whatever it is you know reading is a wonderful thing it's a beautiful thing i believe it was george r, r. martin i'm gonna butcher this quote but he said something along the lines of someone who reads lives a thousand lives and someone who does not lives only one so thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoy this, maybe I'll make some more videos. I don't know. But until then, all the best. Thanks.